tied up with the working class, a very important part of the working class history of Australia. Um, there was a, a boom in the 1850s, but booms are always followed by busts, and the busts that hit in the late 80s and the 90s uh, saw the price of Australian products on the world market plummet. And basically the pastoralists and the employers, um, those of wealth, saw the only way to shore up their profits was to cut down wages by attacking the workers and attacking the unions that protected the the workers' wages, so they went for it, and the miners' union, I think, was the first to get it in the neck, the draymen's union, the dockers followed very soon after that, and in 1891, the attack on, this is a potted history, you understand, <laughs> the attack was launched on the shearers' union. It was an immensely strong union. Some statistics say that there were up to 90% of the sheds were, in fact, unionised, but while the union was strong and its ideals were right, and it was four square solid, it's very hard to combat employers, imported blackleg labour, um, special troops, and the police. And the police were sent in, the special troops I think were sent in, with, with Gatling guns and Norton Nord, Nord, Nord troops. Thousand troops, a lot of, lot of troops in those days. Yeah. And 1,100 special constables sworn in. Yeah, they were, they were going to get the union. In there was a vote to uh, have uh, Lawson for his seditious lives they need to say the fault is ours if blood should stain the bottle. Thrown in the bloody jail for these seditious lines, and there was they, they they moved a boat of tanks for the special constables to have a, a new issue of uniforms. So they had two uniforms, so they could wear their uniforms with pride. And the next day, in the in the uh, the worker up there, Lawson's lines came out. They'd better wear their they'd better wear their uniforms. Um, they may someday be sorry for the front that they have shown. And they, they, they'd better wear their uniforms. They'd better wear them out. They may someday be sorry for the front that they have shown. For ere the nap is worn away, they mightn't like it known. That, that was that, no, no, that was amplifying, thank you. I know, I know you were politics. <laughs> and of, of course in the modern day the same thing's happening, except it isn't special uniforms, it's balaclavas that are issued to so-called security mm. men that are sent onto the That's wharves right. in Brisbane go. with their attack dogs. So some things never change. They become perhaps more subtle, but it's, and that's why this part of history is so important. 14, the 14 leaders were jailed, and Chris told me this, they were sent to jail in the Shearer Strike in chains because the authorities were terrified that they would be rescued and they wanted to preclude any possibility at all. And that's a real fear of a real strength, and that's what the workers have then. It's a superb play. I don't think it's ever been equaled. Um, it's been performed, it was regarded as a communist plot when it first went on stage. 
Um, it ended up being played all around Australia, being included in school curricula, uh, being done by just about every musical theatre society in Australia. So the communist plot it might have been, but by crikey, audiences loved it. And the media, on the other hand, ignored it. And it's probably Any, because... Anything was a communist plot then, though. Oh, yeah, but particularly some coming out of new theatre, particularly something that, you know, said it for the workers. It, it was treated with immense ignore by the mass media. I mean, it was play, it played for nine months. The show ran for nine months. And getting a review in the main media. 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, um, ethos expounded by the play was the most uncomfortable one for the press barons who owned the media, so there's no way in the world they're going to really good reviews coming out about this show. That's all grievance. Original Bushwhackers uh, band and uh, I played Bob the Swaggy in the first Sydney production. How little we knew about the stuff that was going on in the play, about the historical links and such and so on. And even things like, we didn't know what moleskins were. We didn't know what moleskins were. I mean, they were, they were all over the place now, but we didn't know what moleskins were. I saw a production even later on than that, uh, out in the western suburbs, where the bloke came, Joe Collins came on stage in moleskins, and he got all these old fur coats. He had this, all this, these, I'm Anne Kay and I was in the second version of Green River and I also uh -huh. in the ballet. Did we call it ballet? Ballet. And <laughs> a lot thinner then. Um, and I also grew up with the bushwhackers. I was 15 years old when I was getting dragged from pillar post. <laughs>
you can sort of go along and part of it was learning about your own history for, for us. But people forget that. And um, when uh, when I sort of heard about Reedy River and, the, and I was branch chairman and they said, oh comrade, you, 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 we can't do it. And uh, went to a party one night and Chris was playing away on the guitar and I thought, Jesus, look at that. Using his fingers. <laughs>
The farmers pulled up when they were ploughing, they pulled up convict chains, bits of old muskets. Turn Gabby Prison Farm. I lived there. And uh, there was a tree out there, a hill called One Tree Hill. One Tree Hill. And that tree was dead. But that was the flogging tree for the convicts. And the grass still, when I was a kid, there was still no grass growing around that tree. And that was because they flogged the convicts on that tree and they threw saltpeter on their backs afterwards and it soaked into the ground and the grass still didn't grow when I was a kid. Well, that was something for me, eh? Um, I wanted to also acknowledge over here um, Edgar Waters and Edgar was probably the first and perhaps one of the few scholars in Australia that ever spent serious time looking at uh, folk songs in the co and so as they <coughs> excuse me folk songs as they told something about Australia's social history. So I wondered, Edgar, whether you wanted to add, and it was also, of course, the recording editor for um, Wattle Records with Peter Hamilton. So did you want to say anything about the significance of the material, Edgar? Well, it spread a long way between. Uh, it spread a long way beyond Sydney and Melbourne and Newcastle and Brisbane. Uh, the woman who wrote the words for Ballad of 1891, which was so, uh, you've just said, was so important, a political part of the play, was the uh, daughter of Vance Palmer, and the other book that you on was Vance Palmer. And that was authentic. I mean, uh, the tunes had been tidied up in, in Margaret Sullivan's book. Uh, Ron Edwards up in Queensland had enough sense to write to Margaret Sullivan and say, what part did you have in the tunes? And she said, oh, I just sang them, I just wrote them down as Vance, uh, as Vance sang them, but uh, he was a bit irregular. Uh, I, I put all the bars right and so. Down to your six shooters, your troopers and police, the sheep are getting heavy, the fur is in the fleece, there is God and Hells and Gatling, one brief. Talk to Paul Stuckey or, or Noel Stuckey's name. 
and he gave us some money to make the pot. And yeah, not many people know about that. No, what's happened to it? We... Don't know where it is. We we made it out of Smokey Dawson's ranch. Oh, yeah. Out of <laughs> right. We used the, we used the bush yeah. and, the, and the and the old buildings, and we knocked it up out there. Rob Inglis, Australian actor Rob Inglis, played Ned Kelly. And he was fantastic, I'm telling you. What year was this man? Sorry? What year was this man? Approximately. 60s? 60s, yeah. 60s, yeah. And we, we, got, we got a backup. We, we made the pilot. Gary Shearston. Shearston, that's Gary Shearston rode the horse with Ned Kelly's helmet on. Mm. For one scene. Because he wasn't a bad horse. And Rob wasn't much of a horse. And um, then we, we, we got a backer, a millionaire backer in Sydney, and suddenly it was announced that Richardson was going to make Ned Kelly so That was that. Oh, in more sure. ways than one. Yes. And we would have made a fantastic movie, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but I was determined that children in Australia would learn about Australian history and tradition. And I managed to talk the ABC Children's Departments, Education Department. There was a Federal Education Department, had State Departments, a lot of them. And fortunately, there was a, an Australian writer who was in charge of New South Wales State Education, and his name was Christopher Koch. Oh right, he's gone and written many novels and films and been made of his works. And he helped us to do that. I wrote, we got a fellow, a, a Philip Jeans, was his story. He wrote the first script and it was bloody terrible. They had no feeling about Australia. Really. It was corny. And Chris said to me, why don't you go home and have a go and write the, the script? He said, oh, Jesus, I don't know about that. All right, I'll give you go. And I came back with an outline of a play called The Wallaby Track. And I had written songs for kids. And I used the characters like Brumby Jack, Pumpkin Patty, Pumpkin, all those songs. And I wrote it up in a bloody play. And it went on all over Australia. And it was broadcast to every school in Australia. Not only that, it's been on eight times all over Australia. And I've got, had letters and I've gone to see productions of the Wallaby Track. And they refer to it now as the legendary Wallaby Track. <laughs> now, not only that, I went on from there. I have actually done four musical plays for schools which have been broadcast by the ABC to every school in Australia. And really, it's because of my original involvement with reading. That's right. That's why. So, so there you go. It's not dead. And when I published, they published the Reading River, uh, the, uh, the Wallaby Track songbook, and I thought, oh, bugger it, let's put the lager bone in it, and the bones, and tell the kids how to make it. And every school in Australia had a bloody lager bone. <laughs> and they had those spoons and bones. And um, John Manifold hated the lager bone. He did, he hated the bloody lager bone. He wrote down to me and he said, I have discovered that you are responsible for the spread of this bloody instrument. Because <laughs> he got one of, the, one of the books from the ABC and it had, it had me in it and I told me how to make a lager. You're the one! I've been tracking you down! We've seen a stranger dropped into our district last week. He wasn't a bolt. And he wasn't a Greek. We asked, was he Irish? He answers, no. He came from the north where the pineapples grow. We stop the old stories of famine and flood and of crook politicians that suck a man's blood. We had reckoned it might have been local, but no. It's the same in the north where the pineapples grow. One of my LP records was banned by the New South Wales prison system because it had Bold Jack Donahue on it and the wild colonial boy. And they banned it. The prisoners were singing. 
Oh, I'm Robin Holmes from the National Library and I'm an absolute ring in here because the reason that we're interested, of course, is because we collect all this stuff in our collections, in both our oral collections and in our printed music collections and in all of our other kinds of documents. So we're interested in collecting the history and we have a fantastic collection about the history of Red River and the Bushwhackers and you might have seen that we've just launched the CD of the Ramblers, which was the group that the Bushwhackers spawned. And our musical history, if we did know anything, was kind of, you know, a formal version. The only recording we ever knew of Kick Go the Shears was Burl Lives. I mean, so, or Peter Dawson singing Waltzing Matilda with the BBC London Symphony Orchestra. And that was our understanding of Australian bush songs. And this, thinking about that, and thinking about the 1950s and what Reedy River meant and what the bush records meant, became suddenly extremely real to me over the weekend. So, thank you. We should thank very, very much um, both our people from the past, but also the people who made this year's festival yes. and this year's recreation possible. So, living traditions and dead. sung as a song of defiance by the strikers in, in 1891. Fantastic. And, and, con and converting one of the police to the city. Oh, Margaret Walker, yes, she was a very old, close associate of mine because she was working with the folk, folk dance movement and because I was always interested in dancing, our paths across, she actually helped on about the second or third production of Reedy River when we were in St Peter's Lane. Uh, I've lost track of how many productions it was. Uh, and she did some choreography for us in St Peter's Lane so we'd get some fresh fresh approaches into it. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and Margaret and I, because we, I think we were both, I was in the Communist Party and I think... Yeah, well, what about Nell Challingsworth? Was she with them in Melbourne or...? I don't not? remember. I was never quite uh, sure. No. Ring a bell with me. No. Uh, right. No. And then, of course, Margaret Walker and I both ended up receiving an OAM, which at the time, I mean, not in the same year, but it was like, should we accept it or shouldn't we, you know, accept the honours? And I know that I, I took heart in the fact that, well, if Margaret accepted one, it couldn't have been all that bad to accept an OAM. I mean, that was the, and then when her son... Are we talking about dancers who were political? Did, were you... Um, uh, Friendly with Margaret Bard. Oh, too. I was just Unity Theatre did Reedy River in London. Did they? Yes. I only picked yeah, them up no, looking at some of the you know, you forget the history yeah. of it. And there was a reference in one of the books that I was looking at inside the songbook or something. And yeah, and I found that yeah, that's right, they did. And a whole group, Dick Diamond went over to one of the youth festivals, it might have been the Berlin Youth Festival, with some of the members of New Theatre, and they did a, a little truncated version of of, of Reedy with the songs in the main, you know, to do the flag songs. Yeah, so it was, oh, look, you know, the memories and the, the things that are around. And the, you know, you know, get, there you are. Well, I reckon that everybody in the building here must have seen all of the Bushwhackers' performances this weekend, and they must have seen Reedy River. So the combination of that is probably enough for us to talk about the significance of 
why they're here, what value it's been, um, how do you feel about being back together, how did you feel about Ready River, how did you feel about having them watching you? Yeah. There you go, there's a lot of questions to start. Why don't we start then with, has anybody got a question we'd like to talk about? Jaws were moving as they sang along to things like click, but, click Go the Shears and the Rybuck Shear and those other beautiful things. It's hard to imagine now, but they'd almost disappeared a lot of those songs until the collectors like Merrow and the other great ones saved them. New Theatre in Melbourne, and there used to be new theatres all over Australia, the little theatre of the left, the backless theatre, the theatre that wasn't afraid to tell the truth, the theatre that put on a play saying Nazism is dangerous while Chamberlain was still standing around saying Mr Hitler's an awfully nice fellow and he's promised he's not going to do anything wrong. Yeah, the theatre that got into trouble a lot for standing up and, and saying it as it was. New Theatre in Melbourne, New Theatre in Melbourne decided they wanted these songs not only saved but given back to the people. Folk songs are people songs. Folk is people, that's what this festival's about. It's a people festival that belongs to the, to the people. And New Theatre in Melbourne thought we want to give these songs back to those who own them out of whose experiences they've grown. So Dick Diamond was prevailed upon to write a play that would embody the songs. He chose the theme of Reedy River, set in the aftermath of the Great Strike, the sheds were in disarray, a lot of hearts had been broken, it was tough times, but the people got back in there and did the very, very best that they could. And it's a play that embodies all the things that we're proud of in the Australian spirit, the mateship, the, the battlingness, the courage. I mean, it shows the worst side of human nature too. Irish, who wants to punch a bloke out. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he thinks he's... <laughs> yeah, it's an honest, clean, good, strong play. And it's a play that's absolutely full of hope. Uh, Mari was sent down, because uh, Mari was a hooper, professional hooper, as well. Sent down, because uh, Mari was a hooper, professional hooper, as well as being involved with the theatre. The first production in Melbourne in 54 actually had a, a ballet, 53, had a ballet because all shows had a ballet then. So Mari went down to the Melbourne New Theatre production to learn the choreography and bring it back for the Sydney production. And the history of the bushwhackers in the theatre <laughs> is inextricably linked there because, of course, the bushwhackers were all those were musical consultants, weren't you, for the, for the, the whole thing. And, yes, and were the sort of on-stage band for a lot of it. So those two histories are really, really plattered together. It's a superb play. I don't think it's ever been equaled. <laughs> so now if I could hand it to the people who really, Mari, who did, did the work, Chris, who's just a constant source of information, and Bob Bolton, who was, oh, he's gone now, a photographer. Yeah, and the people who, do, the people who really know the history because they, they did it. Yeah, and the wonderful bushwhackers. And, yeah, and I've just been really honoured to have anything to do with this production. I do. I Thank feel honoured. <laughs> When I met Chris, Chris was like, we became very close friends. And uh, I rode on Chris's cable car. He didn't have a cable on, but I still rode on it. Uh, he taught me what I needed to know. And, uh, That's why you've gone wrong. Yep. <laughs> when I finished up, I went along to Reedy River. I went and saw it. And oh, it was just trapped. I went along to Reedy River. I went and saw it. And oh, I was just transfixed by that. They couldn't get rid of me. And I kept turning up. I'd see him going in the stage door. See Harry Cable. Chris <laughs> And I'd be at the stage door and say, Can I come in? I've got nothing for you to do, you know? I said, Well, kind of like Eddie Allison. You've got a long way to go before you come in here, son. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept turning up, and finally I got in, and he, he said, well, you can come in and help me put the set up. So I went in there. And then I, I did that, and then I hung around backstage, and fair dinkum, I learned every part in Reedy River. I wouldn't have cared if Mary got sick of it. I passed Bob the Swagman. I was 18, 19, and it took me two and a half hours to put the bloody beard on, you know, and put all the lines in. Spirit gum. Oh, I can still smell it, eh? And the metho afterwards. And then I used to put the veins on my hands. I was very meticulous. Put all those veins on my hands, you know. I just walk on now. Don't get to that. I've got some little thing too about beards. I had a beard in those days. But she agreed to marry me. If I 
I turned up to the wedding with that bloody beard on, she wouldn't, the, the wedding was off. <laughs> so my beard had to come off and I've never worn it well, since. Well, I was only oh, 16 oh, and a half oh, when I got married, so why should I marry somebody with a beard? <laughs>
got ourselves out of the mess. Then, of course, we're also doing this. It was new theatre in Rui River. I mean, we have to say it was part of that response that we got. And you can't underestimate uh, Rui River in the level that, that the bushwhackers are talking about already and the level that, of importance that it, it was to Sydney New Theatre in that, in that last year. Of course, we're also doing this version for this folk festival, which we knew, of course, you know, it, it couldn't just be a three-act play with a ballet included, which they had long since disappeared anyway from the way it was played. And so uh, we decided that we had to then condense it, but we wanted, we wanted the songs, we wanted the guts of what the story was about, which was extremely important, which I don't have to go into, it already has, uh, the fact that there was such humour in it and such a lovely romance in it, which has also got guts, because it's the conflict of the little woman um, and her stand, stand for unionism in place of her. Then I want to introduce, this is Ellen O'Connell, who came to Reedy River. Just another couple of angles on the historical level too. Um, Dee Bridges that wrote the, the stirring words for that ballad of 1891 that's virtually an anthem. The music. the music, sorry. The words are written by the woman who's actually my French mistress at high school. But Dee, Dean Tom Bridges' son Tom is with us. And Brian Lachlan, the late Brian Lachlan, who was one of the original bushwhackers. And Brian, in fact, introduced me to new theatre and to bush music and to so much. His daughter Jenny's with us. That's yeah. great too. things that I always think back on as far as reading was concerned when we came into it was how little we knew about uh, the stuff that was going on in the play, about the historical links and so forth and so on. And even things like, we didn't know what moleskins were. We didn't know what moleskins were. I mean, they were there all over the place now, but we didn't know what moleskins were. I saw a production even later on than that out in the western suburbs where the bloke came from Joe Collins came on stage in Moleskins and he got all these old fur coats and he had this all this these fur he has fur Moleskins. Other 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 thing white folks wore buggy. You know the traditional story was that they want to stop the snakes from running up the trousers. Uh, uh, you know all, all these sorts of things that, that are now fairly, you know, fairly well not, they weren't there. There, were, there. there was no contact with the stuff which has come about through the propagation of um, and, and, the, and the finding of all of the old bush songs and so forth and people asking questions. On all I can think of, I can think of half the other stuff that we really have to learn about, which is people, you say to people, no, it's, it's still going on. on. It's, can I just say that in this cast we've got some young men and the question of what is a cocky cockroach or a bird, you know? And so even the, the term of cocky and that farmers Something had to be explained. You know, you just forget what we've lost, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know why they come to be called cocky? No. Well, uh, the farm used to spread the wheat out <laughs> to oh, show the wheat and the cocky to come and eat and eat. Yeah. So that's how they come to be called cocky farmers. Can I ask a question about how you found? Ask a question about how you found the songs in the first place. And was, was that John Meredith, or what happened? And I mean, you said you didn't know anything about what they meant. So where did the information and knowledge come from for the bushwhackers, in any case, or for the production? Well, in, in yeah. for the original Ritty River production, it was, as I said, the Melbourne mm -hmm. group, yeah. Melbourne Collective of New Theatre, who had uh, were going on the back of.
production, um, like song books from the original production. And I mean, they're sort of almost in rodeo form, you know, so much beautiful printing. They're still very much as they were, you know, almost straight off the Gestetta. Yeah, the was the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. But they all survive. So we do, and it's quite lengthy notes attached to a couple of the versions of it. So, you know, we're really happy to help anybody look for that material if they want to. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge over here um, Edgar Waters and... Uh, the National Gallery of Australia had an exhibition of Australian folk art and amongst other things they had the ballad of 18, you know, a print of the ballad of 1891, um, worked by an armour music traditional. But a couple of, couple of weeks later I happened to hear Doreen Jacobs being interviewed on the ABC. <laughs> She was expecting to do terrible things. Like <laughs> <laughs> One that was discovered through that was uh, Ted Harrington. Who yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, that really, I noticed yeah. in the original thing it was, it was supposed to be tuned for this one. What was Ted? The words were tuned for that were Ted. Ted, uh, and Ted was still alive then. And uh, the book of his poems were, in, were on sale in that makeup shop. Uh, upstairs Albert? in Pitt Street. Albert? Albert? Yes. This little book of poems by, by, by Ted Harrington was on, was still on sale there. And they had it down there for years and then all of a sudden you know, they went to the music hall. Just to do a plug for your mob. Um, it, Talking about the history in the collections, the Johnny Meredith collections available from ba -ba -boom -boom. <laughs> the National Library sharing the harvest, and that's a that's a gem. I've got a copy of that, and it's there's some delicious stuff. I mean, it's there with warts and all, cracks, crackles, yeah. forgotten lines, you know, drop pokers and dog bark. <laughs> it's wonderful Ooh. stuff. It's yeah. wonderful stuff. This is the material that John collected in the 1950s, which we managed to preserve. It was the first collection of folklore that we ever bought, courtesy of Edgar, wrote a, a paper for the National Library. Harold White was a visionary National Librarian in those days, and he was quite converted, and I found some material in the library files where he actually went to the very first meetings that were held about getting bush clubs and uh, folklore societies and stuff together. And Harold White went and I think talked to lots of people at the time, and made a decision that the library should be collecting what he called the vernacular traditions and the traditions that weren't written down because he said it was extremely important to preserve the whole of our society and not just the stuff that got handed down in formal written texts. Mm -hmm. And he employed, um, asked Edgar to write a um, paper about collecting folklore and that was 1962 or three, Edgar, I think, when that first happened. And it happened that John Meredith's collection had survived. I mean, he'd gone out collecting in the 50s with his great big old uh, tape, original tape recorder. And very strong arm. Very strong arm. <laughs> and, uh, it, and so John Meredith's collection we bought in 1963, and that was the first important collection in right. any collection in Australia. And there that's was also one in Brisbane. There's also one in Brisbane called John Manifold. That's oh, yes. Yes. Please, may I have one minute? Yeah. Um,